funny stories a few and some video clips uh, to talk about and so I'm going to jump right into this thing and maybe we can make this video not quite so long. Uh, there was the variable Venturi carburetors that were on the 5.8 liter police package cars until 1991 and they, they were on other cars before that. Uh, they preceded uh, the in a lot of cases the uh, fuel injection that came out in the Crown Vickies on 19, uh, I'm not 19, yeah, it was uh, 1986 was when Crown Vicks went fuel injected. F-150s got fuel injection in 85, uh, but one way or another, uh, these police officers from the uh, big city police, I say big city, there was like 140 police cars in that town where I worked, and uh, each one of them had one man per car and all that, <clears throat> a lot of police cars in there, so we worked on their cars because they they all had Fords, and so what happened was they would come in there, one of them went on a brand new one that, you know, had not very many miles on it, and they would tell me that they didn't have enough speed and their acceleration wasn't all that great, uh, and so they would want to know if I could do anything about it. Now, in order to know what I needed to do about it, you kind of got to understand how these variable Venturi carburetors operated. Uh, you see these uh, things right here would slide back whenever you applied the throttle. There was a big vacuum diaphragm at the back uh, that would do that. It had a kind of a ported vacuum to it. The problem was when you go to wide open throttle, anybody that's ever watched a vacuum gauge knows that your vacuum tends to fall off. And so the mechanical linkage that uh, these carburetors had on them had to be depended on to pull the Venturi's to wide open throttle position. But the way these were set up, whenever you went to wide open throttle, you only had about half uh, of movement. They would, in other words, these would stop about halfway back instead of going all the way back. And so what I basically did on that, you see they would stop about right here. You see this vacuum diaphragm down here? This vacuum diaphragm, those things like to bust a lot. We had to change those vacuum diaphragms all the time. It just hooked right here. And you'd take the screws out and put it in put that new diaphragm up in there and hook it over that thing, pull on it to make sure it was moving the Venturi and then put it all back together very carefully so you, you know, you'd have a nice vacuum trapped in there and the, the diaphragm was held all the way around. But this carburetor is really pretty simple if you get right down to it. This tapered mod, as this, uh, as this was pulled back and that more air was allowed to go in, that Venturi uh, was basically right here. And so it would get pulled out of this well, and it would go through this jet, and then it would be misted down in here. Look how simple that is. That is really a very simple carburetor. Now, the people that like conventional carburetors didn't like this. Uh, these are, the, these are uh, you either loved them or you hated them. But what I would do with the mechanical linkage was I would change, bend the mechanical linkage a little bit uh, without even the car running. And of course, this thing still had an accelerator pump too. But uh, one way or another, I would bend the linkage so whenever they couldn't depend on the vacuum to open this thing anymore, the mechanical linkage would push this all the way open, which is the way it was supposed to be anyway. But they came out of the factory maladjusted, and whenever, and one of the cops later told me that when I fixed it so this thing would go all the way back uh, like it was supposed to, uh, that the uh, it got his uh, top speed up to like 140 miles an hour or something. And he was able to catch a lot of these little cars that were making a lot of turns in the country. Uh, after I, you know, he said before, uh, if, if you got behind a Toyota and they made a lot of turns on a country road, you'd lose them if you didn't have good strong acceleration. But that fixed that. You know, of course, after that, in, starting in 92, everything had fuel injection on it. And so these things went away in 92. But there were two versions of this carburetor. One was, they called it a 2700. That was the earlier model. Uh, the second one that came out was a feedback carburetor that uh, operated with a mixture control unit and it had a air bleed and they call that a 7200. It was a feedback carburetor, uh, the, the version of this thing. But uh, these were interesting uh, atomizers, I guess you'd call them, and I really enjoyed tinkering with them. 
Now this revenue enforcement officer one day, he came to me on a car like this one right here. Now this was after, this one had fuel injection, it had a 302. I mean, it was about a 90 or a 91 model, but he didn't have the 5.8 with the well, with the variable venturi carburetor. He just had a, you know, a 302 fuel injection. And he was telling me that, he says, my Crown Victoria, my police car won't go but about 100 miles an hour, and I think there's something wrong with it. And um, so he was wearing his uniform, revenue enforcement officer, you know, and his job was to stop these tractor trailers that uh, at random out there on the road, and he had a set of portable scales he carried with him, and he'd have them pull up on those portable scales, and he would weigh those trucks to see if they were carrying too much weight. I think it's 20,000 pounds per axle is what we call for here. But the long and the short of it was, I says, well, I'll test drive this car that fast, but only if you're sitting in the passenger seat, because I don't want to be driving this car going that fast and get in trouble, you know, because somebody thought I was just coon-dogging it. And so he says, okay, so he got in the car with me wearing his uniform with that patch on his shoulder, and we headed off up this long, flat four lane that, you know, headed, went off to the north out of town. And uh, I was hitting about 100 miles an hour, and there was little rises in the road that you could go over, you know. And uh, when I was going over one of those rises, he says, you need to be careful here because there may be a trooper sitting up here. <laughs> yeah. Man, I thought you were a trooper. But it turned out that his car was not a police interceptor. It was just a plain old Crown Victoria that they had given him to do his job in. And I don't know why he thought he needed to go over 100 miles an hour because you're not going to need to chase a truck like that. But one way or another, that just sort of surprised me that this guy was worried about me getting a ticket and him sitting in the car with me, you know. Craziest thing I ran into on something like that. Uh, Mark uh, Shipes, his wife, dropped him off one day. Uh, at, and I was finishing up some work I was doing on a police car and I fell in behind her when she was going up another street over there to the main road that goes back into town. And I didn't think a whole lot about it, but I, I happened to look down at my speedometer and she was running 45 in a 35 and I was basically running 45 too because I was just following her. I didn't even think about what she was going to see when she looked in the rear view mirror. But when she looked in the rear view mirror, you could tell that it scared the daylights out of her because she immediately slowed down to 30 miles an hour. And when she got to the uh, traffic signal up there, I pulled up next to her on the right-hand side, and she was sitting there frozen to that steering wheel and her hands at the 10 and 2 position, looking scared to death. Her eyes were just really wide. And I tore a tap the horn, and she looked over there at me, and when she saw that it was me, she, she grabbed her heart and she shook her fist at me, you know. <laughs> that was, it's real. But I don't know how many times I've been test driving a police car, and you see other cars slam on brakes whenever they're coming to you. you can, it's amazing to me how when you're in the police car you can see them doing that. You know, because that means the cop can see us doing it too. One day I was test driving a cop car and I went, up, went over into the right lane. I was going to go back through the mall and circle around the big mall out there because you can test drive pretty good going slow in that uh, out there without having to fight with a lot of traffic. And there was a big tractor trailer sitting in the turn lane and I, when I pulled up behind him I was waiting for him to get out of the way. He got out of his vehicle and walked back there and says, are you going to give me a ticket if I make a turn here? And I said, I don't care what you do, man. I'm just test driving this car. And I, it's really funny. Um, the, this, on another cop car, they came in, and this circuit breaker was hot, and their uh, their door locks wouldn't work now, and their power went, but their power windows would, but it was on a different breaker. Power seats were supposed to be on this tailgate window key switch if you had a, you know, whatever and then uh, rear lighters and all. Yeah. The, when, that, when I saw that hot circuit breaker, I went looking at all the components that were fed by this, and it, it didn't have power seats because it was a cop car, and those cop cars didn't have power seats. But when I went under the power, under the seat, on the passenger side, the wires that were supposed to plug into the power seat assembly, uh, it, was a, it was a ground wire and a hot wire, uh, this knothead, they had put some guy back there without handcuffs on, and he had taken, somehow, I don't even know how he did this, he took both wires out of that connector shell and touched them together and kind of fouled them where they stay together, and he was trying to make electrical problems for the cop car. I don't know if he was just doing that to aggravate or what. But when I told the cop about it that was waiting for his car to be fixed, 
He said, that was that guy that I picked up this morning. I knew I should have put handcuffs on him. I'm going to find that guy and slap him. But uh, anyway, that's all. that was kind of an unusual situation there. Didn't accomplish anything because all it did was the circuit breaker got hot and the power door locks quit working. You know? Okay, what's this? What's wrong with that picture? Hmm? Pull too far? Think about it. You got high. Yeah, you hooked up. No, look, it, this is where the power is coming from. It it's supposed to be here. going in here. It ain't getting All right, here, I'm going to hold that right there. I want you to twist that battery terminal a little bit on that post. Like this? Yeah, grab it and twist it. Is that cool or what? Yeah. All right, try it again. Oh, look at there. We got some in, didn't we? Mm -hmm. All right, try to start it now. You wouldn't have when we weren't looking. It did, but look at there. It went dark again. You ever seen that before? That happens all the time. All the time. Now watch. Grab that. Pull that light right there. Pull that light right there. All right, this is something that's fairly common. All right, I move that terminal. Try it again. Try to start it. Are you trying to start it? He's text message. There you go. Now it starts. Yeah. You get the point here. That's a really good demonstration of voltage drop on a uh, with using a test light. And whenever I ran into this, this was on a trainer vehicle, the uh, Dodge Neon or um, that we had, or a Chrysler Neon, whoever name they had on that thing, but it was a Neon. And uh, whenever I saw something like that, I would show it to them. There was another bug I like to plant on this Neon where I would disconnect the ground wire that was connected to the body right out there in front of the battery and pull it back out of the way so you couldn't see it. And whenever you did that, the car wouldn't start and the wipers would run all the time. It was great fun getting them to chase that kind of thing. You know. Let off the brake and drive it. Isn't that a nice how do you do? You know, the car comes in for a bumpity bumpity bump and it turned out it had some really bad or one really, really bad U joint on it. And uh, anytime I used to have one on a lift and I could demonstrate something like this by taking a, a film of it or a photo or whatever, I always like to keep that information to share it with my students later on because you don't always get a chance to show them something like this live. You know, in this particular case, this was a very interesting thing. We basically had to replace, we replaced both U-joints as I remember and took care of this problem. Now this guy right here was probably one of the best students I had. I mean, I have I, I had lots of students over the 19 years that I taught. But this guy right here was really good. He was a hard worker. Um, he would leave in the middle of the day and drive really fast to go home and look after the chicken houses that he was supposed to care for and then he'd come back and he'd always show up back on time. He would show up at seven o'clock in the morning and he'd go right to work on whatever I had him working on. Uh, and he, he would really do good work and stay focused on his work until this one other guy who was also a student that wasn't worth much in, in the shop, that guy would show up and when that guy showed up, he would stop working and he would just stand around and talk to that guy. And I was thinking, you know, he could get a lot more work done if that other guy would just stay home from work, from school because that other guy was a really bad influence. And um, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, bad company ruins good morals. Well, in this particular case, this guy needed to have, you know, not have such bad company. Uh, and he would, he would he got a tremendous amount of work done as long as that other guy wasn't around. But it's, it's really like that. I had told one of my guys, or I told all of them, I says, the guys that are standing around the water fountain or the coffee table shooting the bull, well, they should have been working are the ones that are going to be complaining because they didn't turn enough hours. And the guy that I put over here at the local dealer years ago, back in 06 or 07 or whatever it was when he went to work over there, uh, he has told me repeatedly, he says, what you said in the 
uh, when we were in class about the guys standing around talking when they should be working. I see that play out every single week here. You know, and he was always working and not talking, and he turns lots of hours to make good money. These other guys that just kind of want to coast along and not have to do anything don't make much money because you, if you're working commission, typically you're going to get, you know, you're going to earn the money you get paid. Um, a lot of the times if a mechanic is not working on commission, they won't get much done. I mean, that's just the facts of life. It has a lot to do with the person's personal work ethic too, though, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Now these are inner and outer tie rod ends. You got a good shot of both of these. These inside tie rod ends here are pretty bad to wear out. Now you got to screw those off the end of the rack, and sometimes they'll have Loctite on there, so that you need to heat them up just a little bit to melt the Loctite down and get it off there. There's tools that are specially made for that. I took a one and five sixteenths inch uh, wrench, though a, a big old cheap one, and bent it so that I could stick it up in there and put a a pry bar in the uh, box end of the thing to break one loose on a Taurus one time that we were having a terrible time getting off of there. But the long and the short of it is you got this tie rod in and they wear out and get loose in that little ball and then you got this one. Uh, in this particular case we were, we pulled this out because we were going to replace this, this tie rod will all come as assembly and you got to screw that in on it. Now typically you can count the turns when you're screwing these tie rods off and they'll usually be about 20 or 21 turns or something like that but you're still going to have to adjust the toe after you replace the tie rods. That's just all there is to it. You know, you can't claim that your alignment's going to be exactly like it's supposed to be even if you counted the turns. So. That was the name of the technical college when I first went to work there back in the early 2000s. And I made that 30 second spot just for the heck of it with my own equipment on my own time and my own photos. And the um, funny thing about it was I presented it to the president of the college and he didn't even tell me he was going to do it, but one day I was at the barbecue shack eating a burger at lunch and this commercial I made played on the TV that was up on the wall in the barbecue shack. I thought that was pretty darn cool. You see how the watch whenever the pressure actual and the pressure target depart from one another. You see that? Right there. All right, basically that's giving you it's a red flag you got to find out what's going on there um, it may be the pressure sensor that's giving them trouble uh, it may be the uh, actuator you know in the transmission or something like that uh, but that's just something I wanted to pass along there Now, whenever you're working at the press, it's always a good idea to have eye protection. You might notice this little gal here is wearing a full face shield, even though it's flopping around the side. It's going to protect her if something pops off of there. This guy right here is wearing safety glasses. Uh, but I was working the press one time whenever I was working down in Texas. And whenever I was pressing, I don't remember exactly how or why it happened, but something popped off of what I was pressing because it was really tight and didn't want to move. And a little piece of metal came off of that and went into my shoulder. And I guess it's still in there because I never had it taken out. And, uh, I mean, if we did an x-ray, we'd probably find it in there. But it wasn't very big. It was, you know, probably about the size of a little bigger than the tip of a ballpoint pen or something. But it, made, it drew blood. It went through my shirt, went into my meat and drew blood. It didn't hit me. I wasn't wearing safety glasses. It didn't hit me in the eye. Another time, I was working on taking a battery terminal loose, and whenever I, it was in a Dodge pickup, a 78 Dodge pickup, and I was going to clean the battery terminals, and I put my wrench on that battery terminal, uh, you know, the clamp bolt that clamps it on, and when I turned that thing so that it just so happened my hand was right in front of my face, that battery exploded extremely violently, 
and I felt all that stuff hit me on the back of the arm. And the only thing that kept it from getting my eyes was that my arm happened to be between me and the battery because of the way I turned that wrench. You might snort and laugh about safety glasses, but I have been protected more than once, either by chance, well, that's when my arm was in front of it, or wearing the safety glasses, I would see a mark where something had hit the glasses that would have gone right into my eye and I'd have never seen it coming. Uh, but that's sort of, that's a, that's a really serious thing. And I had a hammer on my students to keep eye protection on their faces while they were working. Uh, you don't ever know what's going to happen in the shop with stuff flying around and all that. Now, whenever you crack the throttle on these, that multi-strike goes away. Now, with your MDS ignition, like your hot rod people use, you know, it stays multi-strike the whole time, as far as I know. And also, those are interesting because the ones I've looked at actually uh, have the uh, ignition coil hardwired to ground, and they switch the hot side. Uh, but one way or another, uh, multi-strike is... Uh, good, a good solid way to keep them idle and smooth, make them start better and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but like I say, it goes away when you crack off of an idle. And these, this was on a 94 Escort, so this uh, has been around a long time. Now, this 94 Escort had uh, the, the EDIS system, which had that little 10-pin module, you know, 10 or 12 or many you had. Uh, and that EDIS system only lasted two or three years before they replaced it by having the ignition system controlled out of the engine controller. Uh, but one way or another, this uh, <laughs> my buddy Donnie was working on one of these escorts that had this multi-strike, and he was standing there. He was leaning, standing by the driver's side fender, and he leaned over there, and he said, I think this one right here is the one that's giving the trouble. And that thing jumped out of there and got him with that multi-strike, and he banged his knee on the fender and banged his head on the hood and staggered back. <laughs> I thought he was going to fall. <laughs> thing knocked a tar out of him, you know. But that's nothing to sneeze about. That's like 110,000 volts. And he didn't just get hit once. He got hit three times really fast, you know. I just wanted to cover that. Now, this right here, this boy had taken, he was turning in at his driveway on this uh, F-150. Of course, it's got the big fat tires on it and all that. But he was turning it in his driveway and the lower ball joint just popped. Now, usually that's when lower ball joints will break or give way is when you're turning in slow parking lot maneuvers because there's not a whole lot of stress on them going down the highway straight. But if this had happened going 60 or 70 miles an hour around a curve, it would have probably flipped the truck end over end and, you know, we just would hope he was wearing a seat belt. But anyway, what we had to do was uh, I, had, I had to work on this. I didn't really have a good way to put it in the shop, and it was left behind the shop out there in the parking lot. And so we had to get out there and, with all of our stuff and dragging air hose out there and all that stuff and, and, uh, and get that thing uh, swapped out out there. Uh, so that was a, that was a grand adventure. Uh, we, met, we got her done, though. Hold the brake and, hold the brake and make it move. You got it? Do it. Do it again. Back and forth. See, it's sort of shifting at the bottom. And that mount on the bottom has been attacked by oil. And it has come apart. Whenever you see the engine moving as much as that was, the only one that, the only thing that kept it from moving more than it did was that dog bone strut. It has two of them. It's got two of these dog bone struts on it. And that is what a lot of people would do on these engines uh, and the other ones where the uh, spark plugs were hard to get to in the back is they would take those dog bones loose. They would roll the engine forward so that they could do all of that. I mean, so they could change out the plugs on the back. But these dog bones kind of kept this from moving more than it should. That's a 3.8. So just uh, if, you, if you see that. I have another cool video I'd have to look up where I actually took a picture of a Cadillac motor mount where uh, whenever it was being, you know, they were torquing the engine, it would lift up and you could see it coming apart and all that. Some of your V8 Chevys, though, would have a sort of a little yoke over the part of the mount, you know, in case the rubber broke. 
that the yoke would keep the engine from, you know, trying to flip over in the body and all. Now these headlight circuit breakers have been around for a long time. In the headlight switch, there is a circuit breaker. And if you leave the headlights on long enough and that circuit breaker is beginning to become compromised, it'll start doing what you're seeing these Jeep headlights doing right here. And they would flick off and on and off and on. Uh, back in 1977 when I was working at that shop over here in town, uh, this guy that I worked next to was a really good mechanic. He still actually does really good mechanic work and he's, a, he's the head of the uh, local school bus shop and they got 40 or 50 school buses he is responsible for maintaining over there. He's got a crew that works with him. But he's really sharp and does really good work. And on a 72 LTD he had to replace the headlights which was really aggravating to get to because of this same problem. I mean, that's how long these things have been out there. And this is like a, a, a 87 model Wrangler or something like that. But uh, the point is uh, he was <laughs> He had already changed that thing because of this flickering headlight business. And when we got through with whatever work we were doing, we would take our little notebook or our clipboard and all, we would write down what we did so that we could compare notes at the end of the week with the guy that owned the shop and get paid and all that. And so I, I was, he was somebody that didn't put up with any crap out of anybody, you know. And it, he was, but I was picking at him all the time, you know, and sometimes he'd get really mad at me. And he uh, had just changed out his headlight switch. And it had been a long, difficult job. And so I walked up there, reached in the window where you had open window, the headlight switches over on the left side, and I started turning the lights off and on a little bit while he was standing there. <laughs> and he wheeled around, and he just knew there was a big uh, big problem there that he had, he had missed. But anyway, uh, he didn't appreciate that much. But anyway, I could tell you a lot of stories about that guy. He was a piece of work. This is freeze frame data. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but whenever you've got a code, uh, Chrysler would call this a similar conditions window on their DRB3 back in the days when they were using that. And so basically this tells you where the prevailing parameters were when this code was set. See on this one here, it was basically traveling 42 miles an hour when that code set. Uh, and you know, you, it tells you what the fuel trims were, it tells you what your manifold absolute pressure was, and you know, math, you notice this has got manifold absolute pressure and mass airflow. It'll tell you where your throttle was and all that. Now, if you're having trouble trying to duplicate whatever you think might be wrong with this, as clear as much as you can, if you can go use your throttle and your and duplicate at this speed and try to get this as close as you can to the same condition, you can see if it will set again. The, and freeze frame data is really handy um, in, in these uh, engine uh, input situation whenever you're trying to find a code. Look it off. Alright, you notice whenever you switch that engine off, the pressure went up briefly and then it went back down. And basically because this particular one has got a uh, the fuel pressure vacuum fuel pressure regulator. When you switch off the key, the pump is still running for just an instant, and it goes up because the vacuum goes away from the regulator. That causes the pressure to go up. But you notice how it leaks right now. Typically, that's going to be going back through the fuel pump because there's a little check valve in the fuel pump. In this particular case, um, it took a fuel pump to fix this one. But sometimes you'll have a you'll have something else that's causing it. If your engine's running rich or if you've got fuel trims indicating that there's too much fuel going in there, which would be negative fuel trims, and you've got one like this that's leaking down faster than it should, they won't always leak down this fast, but it ought to hold a good solid pressure after you shut it off uh, for a couple of three minutes anyway uh, before it starts to bleed off just a little. Um, but when I was working on uh, vehicles that had a complaint of driving a long way and then losing power and quitting, I would put the fuel pressure gauge on them and I would just let them run sometimes four or five hours and then all of a sudden I noticed that the, uh, that the engine would be dead it, or I'd hear it die and then I go over and start it up and the pressure would come up and then while it was running the pressure would go down and then the engine would die again. That would flag that as a fuel pump problem and so that was fairly common for a while back in the day. But anyway this should not happen on a hot engine 
if you've got one that's not holding pressure, you're going to have a hard to start situation. My Explorer is doing this right now. Uh, if I just get in it hot after I just parked it and went in the store to get some bananas or something, come back out and spin it over, uh, it spins for a little bit before it starts and it may start and die. But if I turn the key on two or three times and let the pump pressure up the fuel rail, it'll start right up. See, that's one way you can kind of get an idea of what's going on with that. Listen to this noise here. Is that ridiculous belt right there is the cause of that noise. That is the cause of that noise right there. That kind of belt will make a lot, a, a lot of noise. And it'll make you think you got bad bearings, a bad alternator, a bad power steering pump, all kinds of crud. And it's the stupid belt. Oh. That's the problem with that. Yeah, that's I've not good at all. I've talked about those belts that might before. Make a noise, it? Here's a ball joint making a racket. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a serious problem. That one there could come apart without warning. Thank you.